if you were to join the Navy or some other maritime service, you would find that early in your training, you learn that if you go overboard, if you're in the water, the universal call for help, ship ahoy! I was drifting away on life's pitiless sea, and the angry waves threatened my ruin to be. When away at my side, there I dimly descried a stately old vessel, and loudly I cried, Ship ahoy, ship ahoy, and loudly I cried, Ship ahoy. Twas the old ship of Zion, the sailing along. All aboard her same joyous, I heard their sweet song. And the captain's kind ear, ever ready to hear my wail of distress as I cried out in fear. Ship ahoy, ship ahoy, as I cried out in fear. Ship ahoy, the good captain commanded a boat to be lord. And with tender compassion, he took me on board. And I'm happy today, all my sins washed away in the blood of my Savior. And now I can say, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. From my soul I can say, bless the Lord. O oh, soul sinking down, deep sin's merciless wave, the strong arm of our captain is mighty to save. So trust him today, no longer delay. Board the old ship of Zion and shout on your way. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing and shout on your way. Jesus saves. Amen. Amen. God bless you, brother. Very nice. You know, I haven't heard that song in many, 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 many years. I was a child last time I heard that song until about three weeks ago, wasn't it, Gina? We were in Florida and Brother Bill Harper, uh, Brother Charles may know Brother Bill Harper, down in Florida for the Florida State Association, he got up and sang that song and I thought to myself, I hadn't heard that song in many, 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 many years. And it was true then, it's still true. And now here it is twice in about two or three weeks I've heard that song. What a great message in that song. My soul was lost on the seas of life and I cried out to the Lord and he rescued me and he brought me on board and gave me the grace that only God can give me. And I know that's not the exact words of the song, but that's the gist of the song and what a great message it is. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for allowing me to be here. I put a video on Facebook a couple of weeks ago and even called 
Brother Ryan Miller by the wrong name, I called him Ryan Smith up there, but the word got out that I was coming through Kansas City and Brother Moore contacted me that evening and said something about me coming by and through his legwork and me talking with Brother Greg, here I am and I'm thankful to be here. I am Roger Stewart, I'm the Secretary Treasurer of Missions. I was elected to this position last year in June when the ABA meeting was in Knoxville, Tennessee. My wife Gina is with me, she travels everywhere we go. Um, that's the nature of we. When we go, she goes with me. Well, she sleeps and I drive. That's how it works. Uh, you know, there's a steering column in your vehicle. And D, right, stands for dream. Well, that's what my wife thinks. So every time I put it in D, she goes to sleep and I drive. And she wakes up somewhere along the way and she says, are we there yet? And I think to myself, I'm raising kids again. No, I'm just kidding. So my wife, Gina, and I travel all over together. She does sleep and I do drive, but I'm thankful to have her company and we're grateful and humbled and honored to be able to serve in this capacity. I pastored churches just like this church, El Bethel Missionary Baptist Church for 33 years. I pastored in Arkansas and I pastored in Michigan. And so I have some experience on the foreign mission field. Uh, that's a, kind of a joke, sort of, but not really, right? And uh, for 33 years, I pastored churches, and for uh, 21 of those 33 years, I served on the Standing Missionary Committee. And for several of those 21 years, Brother Charles Moore ser served on the Standing Missionary Committee, and that's how I became acquainted with him, and we got to be friends and buddies, and now we're Facebook friends. And so the legwork that was done by Brother Charles was... Um, honored by Brother Greg, and so we're happy to be here tonight, very thankful to be here, and uh, we're here tonight to stand before you and share with you just some information about what's going on with the missionaries of the American Baptist Association. So here's the, the question that oftentimes comes around, and that is, I want to know what that Stewart fella does. What exactly does it mean to be Secretary Treasurer of Missions? Why did he give up pastoring a local New Testament church to become a missions uh, treasurer and do what he does now? Well, the answer to that question really is pretty simple. I can narrow it down to a couple of things. If you were to take a yearbook, a, a minute book, we sometimes call them, of the American Baptist Association, and you just search from cover to cover, front to back, and said, I want to know what Stuart does. What is the job of the Secretary Treasurer of Missions? You could really boil my job down to two things. Number one, my job is to recommend the missionaries. So in order to recommend the missionaries, I have to know something about them. So we visit the missionaries, we stay in contact with the missionaries, and we work with the missionaries to some degree. Not every day, not um, every week or every month are we gone, but we have a, a relationship and we build communication with the, relationship, with the missionaries. And number two, my job is to report to the churches. Because we have churches just like El Bethel Missionary Baptist Church that support the work of ABA missions every month with very generous offerings. And so this is the time when I want to say, and I say it from my heart and I mean it uh, very sincerely and honestly, how much we appreciate, how, much, how grateful we are for what you do. I know that every month you send a check for $85 to Texarkana to help the missionaries. And so we go around, we report to the churches what's going on with the missionaries, and while we're doing that, we say thank you to churches like El Bethel Missionary Baptist Church for the work that you're doing to help us. And if you really, if you really narrow down what I do um, to its basic, basic idea, my job is to help the churches help the missionaries. Because all of these missionaries that I'm going to tell you about in just a minute are sent out by churches just exactly like yourselves. Churches that in Arkansas, Missouri, Kansas, Indiana, Michigan, and all over the world are going with the gospel of Jesus Christ to share the good news of what Jesus Christ has done and is doing. And it takes churches just like yourself to do that. So we stand before churches to recommend the missionaries to them, to report to the churches about what's going on with them, and to ask you to help us help them. Now you're doing that, and we're so very thankful for that, but we want to ask you to prayerfully continue to do that. We have 
Well, in June, I'll just give you some exact numbers. June, last month, 2020, we had 446 churches, just like you guys, send offerings to Texarkana. Now you say, that's a lot of churches, and that adds up to be a lot of money. And you'd be right, that is a lot of churches. And it does add up to be a lot of money. But here's why. We have today 151 missionaries. 151 missionaries scattered all over the world preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those missionaries are in 24 of the 50 United States. So just mark off half of the United States of America, and we've got a missionary in half in all of those states preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they're in 24 of the 50 states. They're in 26 foreign countries, Philippines, Mexico, Canada, Thailand, Australia, Indonesia, all over the world. Today, there are missionaries sent out by churches just like yours preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ on six of the seven continents on this planet. That means that right now the only continent on this planet that does not have an ABA missionary is Antarctica. And I'm looking for the guy, and Brother Greg's trying to volunteer his son, I see. I'm looking for the guy who will load up his wife and kids, move to Antarctica so that next month I can say we got the whole world covered. You know, I told that story and said that when we were doing a, a, a missions conference down in uh, Mississippi and these two young fellows were sitting right there. They were in high school. They were brothers. They started, we'll do it. We'll go. Brother Roger, we're your guys. Just wait a couple years when we get out of school. Well, apparently during the night, they went home and asked Alexa or Google or Siri or somebody about, about um, Antarctica because the next night they came to the mission conference and they said, we ain't going. <laughs> Evidently in Mississippi, they don't get quite the snow that, that, that comes in Antarctica. So the only continent on the planet, you think about this, the only continent on the planet tonight that does not have an ABA missionary is Antarctica. Brother Randy Cloud, when he was Secretary of Treasury of Missions, he used to say the sun never sets on ABA mission work. And he's right. And that's still true. 151 missionaries in 24 states, in 26 foreign countries, on six of the seven continents on this planet, sent out by churches just like you, supported by your church and many, many others, are doing the work of the gospel to share the message of Jesus Christ to indigenous people in a foreign land, learning a new culture, a new language, and new traditions. Some of them have moved their wife and kids across the globe to do it, and they're faithfully serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, back to that 446 churches. Let me say it like this. If I go to the post office five days a week, and I do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, every day, I need to get out of the post office box every day $9,200 because to pay these missionaries takes a lot of money. And we're so thankful that you participate in that way and help us. $85 a month is $85 more than we'd have if we didn't have you. You know, we got one church every month. I look forward to it now. I open the envelope from this one church every month, sends a check every month without fail for $11. We need $11 a month churches. We need $25 a month churches. We need $85 a month churches. We need $2,000 a month churches. We got about a half a dozen churches that send about $2,000 or a little bit more. We need $2,000 a month churches because I need to pay these missionaries. I need to get out of the bank every day $9,200. You see, my monthly budget is $184,000. Now, before I took this job, I never dreamed of checks like that. And now I write crazy number checks. $184,000. This year, the associational year that we're in right now, will be the second year in the history of the American Baptist Association. We're almost 100 years old as, a, as an association. This year will be the second year in the history of the American Baptist Association. Our, month, our, our annual missions payout will exceed $2 million. Our payout this year is $2.2 million. So we have to have churches like El Bethel Missionary Baptist Church to come alongside us and help us to pick up the load for these guys. Not all of them are on salary. 
Some of them are on designated funds, but even missionaries on designated funds need the help of the churches because they still receive a salary. Somebody's paying their salary. And I can tell you, we have a church right now that's in the process, a church in Arkansas, it's a small church in Arkansas. They called me about, two, about a month and a half ago and they said, Brother Roger said, we found some extra money in our treasury. Wouldn't every church like to say that? We found some extra money in our treasury and I'm gonna tell you all a secret that I hadn't told very many people. They made a decision about a month ago to send every missionary that's sent out by the ABA on designated funds a $1,000 check to do whatever they want to with. And so they sent $15,000 last month to the first 15 guys. This month they're gonna send another five for five guys. Next month another five for five guys until they cover the whole list. And now that's money beyond, above and beyond the $184,000 I need to pay the regular salaries. We need churches like that to do what you're doing already. That is help us help the missionaries. That's really what we're trying to do. The missionaries don't work for me. They don't answer to me. They, they answer to their churches. They work for their churches. They have a relationship with their churches. But our job is to go to the churches, tell them what's going on with the missionaries, that is to give them a report and to recommend the missionaries. Say, so here's what's happening. So my wife and I do a lot of traveling. We were in Texas last weekend. We're in Missouri this weekend. We're gonna be in Indiana next weekend. And we're going home between all those stops. This year already, we've been in Mexico City. We've been in Costa Rica. We've been um, in Acuna, Mexico, Del Rio, Texas. I don't even know how many times we crossed the border that week, but it was a lot back and forth. We were supposed to go to Colombia and organize a work in Colombia, actually three works. Brother Gilberto Pinzon, one of our missionaries, has got a work ready to organize. And Brother Carlos Julio Mendoza, one of our missionaries, has two works ready to organize. But coronavirus got in the way of that and we had to reschedule. Now it looks like maybe next March, but we've got a work in Indiana. It's going to organize um, in September. Brother Mike Weiler in Brownstown, Indiana. Uh, Brother Scott Borden has just opened up a brand new work in Indiana. We have new works opened in Iowa, in Romania, in Philippines. Uh, we've had organ uh, churches organized in Philippines, in Kenya, and Uganda. All of that's happened in the last uh, few months, and we're so thankful for what's going on. So before we leave today, be sure and go by the, the display back there in the foyer. Uh, my wife has put together bags, and uh, we, we encourage one bag per family, uh, and inside that bag, there's one of everything that's on the table. Now, if you want something else or more than one of each item, stop at the table, pick up an extra pen or a pad or a clip or a letter opener, and take them with you, because all of that is provided so that you, when you pick it up and use it, you'll remember to pray for the missionaries. That's really what we want you to do. We want you to pray for these 151 missionaries that are preaching all over the world the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, like I said, we've got pens and, and pads and letter openers and, and reports, and we've got mission news and views back there. Get and Let me tell you, the best thing we've probably got back there are those little blue clips that have a magnet in them that you can, listen, those magnets are the best magnets I think I've ever seen. Those magnets are so strong, they'll almost stick to aluminum. Some of y'all need to go back to eighth grade science class. But they're great magnets, they got great clips, and the best thing you can do with those magnets is stick them on your refrigerator, right? They'll hold recipes and they'll hold pictures and, the, and they'll hold pictures of your grandkids. And if you don't have grandkids, get one of my business cards back there. It's got my picture on it. Do not put my picture on your refrigerator. But it's got my email address on it. Email me, I'll send you a picture of my grandchildren. You can put my grandchildren on your refrigerator and every time you'll go by, you'll smile and you'll remember me and that will remind you to pray for the missionaries, okay? So before you leave, go by, eat, at least each family get one of those bags. My wife's already put it together. And if you want more than what's in the bags, you can look at that table and pick up a few extra items. One of the things, if you look at the pictures and the information on the display, one of the items you will see on the display back there is that for the month of June, we had a hundred, almost a, almost a 32,000, it was a $31,800 deficit. 
deficit. That means that the $184,000 it took to pay the missionaries last month, we only got about $150,000 in the mailbox. Now we have a balance, and I'm very thankful for that. But when you eat into the balance $32,000 a month, the balance goes away pretty quickly. So would you pray with us about that? Uh, you're helping us, and thank you for that. But you can pray with us that more churches would help us. You, you say, well, you say 446 churches, that's a lot of churches. Yeah, but to be honest with you, we need about another 30, 40 churches to come on board every month with some good offerings to help us because right now we are eating into our balance. We've got a good balance. I'm very thankful for that. I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, having a pity party up here because really I'm not. But whatever balance you have in your checking account, if you have a $32,000 a month deficit every month, it wouldn't take long to eat that up. So pray with us about that. Pray for the missionaries. We've got a huge responsibility to take care of them. And after we're done here in a couple of minutes, if you have questions, I'd be delighted to answer questions for you. My wife can answer a lot of the questions. And tell you, I'll tell you a little secret too. I don't tell this everywhere. I should, I guess, but I, it, it slips me. But if you will let my wife know, maybe take one of those pieces of paper off the, the notepad, write your name and mailing address down, she'll put you on a mailing list that will ensure that you get the mission news and views free of charge in your mailbox every spring and every fall. We put that article, that, it's a magazine basically. We put it out twice a year and the missions office pays for all the expense of that and it'll give you a lot of information about the missionaries. We'll send it to you free of charge to your mailbox. Just write your name and address down and um, uh, keeps you up to date on what's going on with the missionaries. Since we met last year in June, so just now a year, not quite a year and a month, the missionaries have reported 5,722 professions of faith. Isn't that great? That's why we do this. That's why every one of your $85 a month matters. That's why those $11 from that one church matters. That's why we need $2,000 a month churches because today there's almost 6,000 people that are heaven bound who this time last year were hell bound. And had we not had the COVID-19 inflict our world in the last few months, I'm certain those numbers will be closer to 10,000 10, souls saved versus 6,000 souls saved. So you're doing a great work, church. Thank you for it. Continue to do it. Uh, bless the missionaries with your offerings and with your prayers, with your love and with your encouragement. And uh, I know that God will be happy with that. And we certainly, most certainly are. I want to share with you tonight a message that I have on my heart with a time that's allotted me entitled The Crisis of the Cross. The Crisis of the Cross. I entitled this message The Crisis of the Cross because this is something you may or may not know about. Every crisis you ever face, every crisis you ever face, whether it's a spiritual crisis or a financial crisis or a domestic crisis or a social crisis, or an educational crisis, every crisis you ever face in all of your life will always, without exception, always require of you a decision. Every crisis requires a decision. And when you look at the cross of Calvary, you face yet another crisis. And the decision you make is, what am I going to do with the cross? And if you've already made that decision, you know people in your circle of friends, in your neighborhood, in your family, at work, at school, you know somebody who has to make the same decision that you've made. They're going to have to do something with the cross of Calvary. Thus, the crisis of the cross. My text comes from Ephesians chapter 2, where I'm going to read verse 11, 12, and 13. Would you find your place in Ephesians chapter 2 where we can read verses 11, 12, and 13? And when you find your place there, would you stand please, stretch your legs just a little bit, but more importantly, pay, pay honor to the Word of God and the reading of God's Word in Ephesians chapter 2 beginning in verse 11 through verse number 13. Paul says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were the called are called uncircumcision 
by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time, in other words, the time when you were referred to in that way, that at that time you were, number one, without Christ. Number two, you were being alienated. You were aliens of the commonwealth of Israel. Number three, you were strangers from the covenant of promise. Number four, you had no hope. And number five, you were without God in this world. Well, let me tell you, that's a pretty desperate person. A person who is an, without Christ, a person who is an alien, a person who is a stranger, a person who has no hope, and a person who is without God is a desperate, desperate person. Verse 13, but now. <laughs> Don't you like that? That's what you were. That's your past. That's what you were at one time in a life before today. That's what you were. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You may be seated. Oftentimes our faith is made stronger when we remember what we've been through, where we've come from, what's happened to us in the past. And Paul calls to remembrance, verse 11, did you notice that? Wherefore, remember, remember. It's good that Christians and believers remember. Now, I'm not going to assume tonight that everybody in the building is born again, saved, that you're a Christian. But if you are, then I want you to take a moment and, and remember with me a few things that your salvation has meant to you. Paul says we need to remember <coughs> In this same chapter of Ephesians chapter two, in verse number one, we are called to remember what we're saved from. Do you remember what you're, when you got saved, the day you asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and, and you received the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior of your life? Do you remember what you were saved from? Well, verse number one of Ephesians two says you were saved from your trespasses and your sins. And let me tell you, that's a good thing to be saved from. Because I understand what trespasses are. I understand what sins are. I understand what it is to be a sinner. I know what it means to fall short of the glory of God. And when I remember what God saved me from, I can't help but be thankful. It's good to remember. Do you remember what you were saved for? See, when you got saved, when you asked Jesus Christ into your heart, he didn't just save you from sin, he saved you for a reason. He saved you for a purpose. He saved you for something. And verse number 10 tells us he saved you for good works. God intended for you and for me when we received Jesus Christ to be about his business, to do his work, to do something to prove that we have a relationship with the Lord and to do something that would bring others to a relationship with the Lord. Do you remember the day you were saved, what you got saved from? Do you remember the day you were saved, what you got saved for? Do you remember the day you were saved, what you got saved to? You say, well, I didn't know I was saved to anything. Well, verse six says you were, you were saved to exceeding riches. God put in your life God invested into your future. God gave something for you in your eternity that cannot be measured on this earth. It can only be described as exceeding riches. It's good to remember, isn't it? I remember the day I was saved. Thursday, vacation Bible school. I was nine years old. Grand Avenue Baptist Church, Fort Smith, Arkansas. Right there. I remember what I got saved from. I remember what I got saved for. I remember what I got saved to. Paul said, wherefore we remember. Listen, it's good for Christians to remember. It makes their faith stronger. When I remember what God has done for me, when I remember what God, where God's brought me from, when I remember what God has provided for me in days gone back and days gone past, then when I face crisis today, when I face dilemmas today, when I face problems today, I remember what God did then. I have confidence God can do that again. 
I have confidence that God will see me through this valley, that God will get me over this mountain, that this very difficult moment in my life will soon become a chapter already written because God will bring me through the difficulties of life. Why? Because I remember. I remember what God did back then. And in the context of what we're reading today, the Apostle Paul says, do you remember? Do you remember in times past Do you remember what it was like to be lost? Do you remember? Notice the language of verse 11. Wherefore we remember being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So there's two descriptors in verse 11 that Paul gives the Ephesians that I remind you of tonight that remind each of us what we should remember as born again believers. Number one, we ought to remember that I'm a Gentile. And number two, that I am named among the uncircumcised. Now, those are pretty big words and pretty um, explicit terms. But here's what this boils down to. Paul was reminding the Ephesians that Without Christ, you are without hope. Because the Gentile world was viewed by the Jewish world as having no Messiah, no God, no legitimate religion, no possibility for redemption, no hope for atonement. And even the the uncircumcised world, and that might include some Jews. You know, there were Jews around the world who were Jews by faith who were not circumcised Jews. And and if you really get down to splitting hairs on this, the, the Jews of Judea around Jerusalem looked at the Jews around the Galilee as, well, less than Jewish In fact, when Jesus came on the scene, don't forget this, when Jesus came on the scene, the Jews in Jerusalem said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? You remember that? This Jesus that you call Messiah, this Jesus that you call Lord, this Jesus that you call Savior, this Jesus that you call Redeemer, this Galilean Jesus who is a Jew, you know what the the Jews in, in Judea said? He's not good enough to be a real Jew. Why? Because nothing good's ever come out of Nazareth. Right? They argued about this. They went to the the nth degree. Not only did they say, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? There was a time in John chapter 7, verses 40 through 53, they argued that whether or not the Christ, a true legitimate Christ, could come from Galilee. So here's this this dilemma. You remember I told you that every crisis requires a decision. So here's our crisis. We're Gentiles. We're uncircumcised. We're not like them. We don't have the heritage. We don't have the genealogy. We don't have Abraham's blood. And you know what? All that's right. And before... I had Jesus Christ, I had wants, I had lacks, I had needs. Something was missing, something was awry, something wasn't up to snuff. You see, before I had Jesus Christ, I was, and ever since the word, this Gentile, uncircumcised, lost, hopeless person that had no promise for future. I was this spiritual wreck that's described in verse number 11. Remember when you were lost, what was missing, what was lacking, what you didn't have that you needed? Now notice verse number 12. He goes on to describe that condition. That at that time, when, 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 when I was a Gentile, when I was lost, when I was uncircumcised, when I was without the Lord Jesus Christ, at that time, verse 12, and here's how he describes my life then. 
Number one, Christless. I was without Christ. Do you know people who are Christless? Listen, I know nothing about Belton, Missouri, except that it's south of Kansas City. But I know enough about the human species to know that in Belton, Missouri, there are thousands of people who are Christless. You know who they are? They're spiritual Gentiles. They're spiritually uncircumcised. There's something missing in their life. There's something lacking in their life. And they could very well go to the grave without Jesus Christ. And that would be the saddest commentary ever written on their lives. I remember before I was saved, I was Christless. Now listen, I, as I've already mentioned, I was nine years old when I accepted Jesus Christ into my life. I hadn't spent too many days in prison at nine years old. I hadn't drank a lot of liquor at nine years old. I hadn't smoked a lot of wacky weed at nine years old. I hadn't taken a lot of, I'm being silly, right? I, I was saved, I, you know, I was, I'll say it like this, I was taken to church nine months before I was born. You know what that means? My mom and daddy went, right? I, was, I wasn't saved from this terrible, terrible, terrible life. You understand what I'm saying? I wasn't saved from prison. I wasn't saved from jail. I wasn't saved from drugs. I wasn't saved from this. I, wasn't, I, was, I was going to church when I got saved. I was saved in church. I wasn't saved from a terrible life, but I'm gonna tell you what I was saved from. My sin. And that's what everybody's saved from. And my sin made me this spiritual Gentile that is described in verse number 11, this uncircumcised person that is described in verse number 11, this sin that I had in my life made me Christless. That's what I got saved from. And I can assure you there are people in your life, in your circle who are Christless, who need to be saved. Number two, notice what he said. We are aliens. That means that we're friendless. Have you, ever, have you ever been somewhere in the world, in town, in the United States, in a community, maybe out in the country, and you looked around and you thought to yourself, I don't, I don't know that I belong here. You know? I'm not, I'm not sure that, that, this, that these are my people. I feel a little alienated. I feel like maybe I'm, I'm out of my, my circle. Have you ever been in that spot where you, you looked around and you thought to yourself, I don't have any friends, I don't have any family, and I don't have anybody to fellowship with? Hey, listen, if you, if you ever get outside of uh, central United States here and, and broaden your horizons, there's places not too many hours drive from where you're sitting right now that will make you very uncomfortable very uncomfortable. And you know what? You might wake up one day and think to yourself, I don't have any friends here. And I don't have any family here. I, I think I'm in the wrong place. I'm an alien. It is a sad thing to be friendless. When I was pastoring in Michigan, I was um, um, on call for a, a funeral company that owned five funeral homes. And uh, whenever someone passed away, if they did not have a minister to conduct a funeral service, they would say, do you mind if a Baptist pastor does your funeral service? And if they agreed to that, the funeral home would almost inevitably call me. I was in Michigan nine years, and I did 139 funerals in nine years. I did three in one day twice. Three funerals in one day two different times. And I was called upon to do the funeral for a, a, a gentleman um, who had quite a lengthy list of, um, of awards and presentations and, and honors to his name. And I went to this graveside service to conduct this funeral for a gentleman, are you ready? Who was George Patton's personal driver in the European theater during World War II. Can you imagine riding around with him for a day? He was his personal driver. And when I got to the graveside service, 
It was me and the funeral director, both of us with the casket in the back of a hearse, drove in one vehicle to the funeral, to the cemetery. There was a sexton. You know what a sexton is? The guy that digs the graves. So it was a funeral director, a preacher, a sexton, the man's daughter, her husband, and one family friend that read in the newspaper this guy had died. Six people at this man's funeral. And listen, he was a war hero. The list of honors and medals that were attributed to this man were as long as my arm. And six people showed up for his funeral, three of which did not know him. I know that for a fact because I was one of those three. Two were his family. The man died, dare I say, with one friend in this world. Before I got saved, I was Christless. I was friendless. Number three, I was homeless. He says in verse number 12, not only are we aliens, but we are strangers. This is not my home. I'm a stranger in this land. And before I met Jesus Christ, I had no home. Not like I have today. I've got a great home awaiting me now. The promise of eternity is my home. I have a mansion waiting for me. I know because Jesus has gone to prepare it for me. But you think about this. Before I knew Jesus as my Savior, I was Christless. I was friendless. I was a stranger. I was homeless. I'm still a stranger on this earth, but I know where my home is. I got a home waiting for me. Can you imagine? Listen, if you're born again, if you're saved, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, can you imagine being Christless now that you know what it means to have Christ? Can you imagine now what it means to be friendless now that you know of a friend that sticketh closer than a brother? Can you imagine singing the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and thinking to yourself, what does that mean? Can you imagine... Your life without the promise of a home someday in eternity, being homeless. And number four, those who do not know Jesus Christ are not only Christless and friendless and homeless, but maybe one of the most tragic things in this world, they're hopeless. They have no hope. Do you see that in verse number 12? They have no hope. Let me tell you a little something about hope, okay? I know this, not because I personally have experienced it, but I've seen it in the ministry. When you pastor for 33 years or more, you'll see this. I promise you, you'll see this. A man can live, and I say a man, a woman, a, a person can live for decades without a spouse. People do it every day. They can live, a man can live for weeks without food. A man can live for days without water. A man, are you ready? A man can live for several minutes without breath. When I pastored in Michigan, I mean about every winter, they'd pull some child out of that lake that fell through the ice and had been submerged for 20, 30, 45 minutes, resuscitate that child, no brain damage, no lasting effects, send them to school in about two or three days. Man can live for decades without a, spy, a spouse. Man can live for weeks without food. Man can live for days without water. Man can live for many minutes without breath. But I'm gonna tell you, man cannot live that long without hope. You know why? Because they'll end it. A man, a woman, a boy, a girl, a mom, a dad, a husband, a wife, a grandma, a grandpa, an aunt, an uncle that has no hope will put an end to it right now. Can you imagine going through life Christless, friendless, homeless, 
hopeless. Those who do not know Jesus are all of those things. And number five, the last thing tonight is this. If you do not know Christ, or if you know someone who does not know Christ, you are all of those things, Christless, friendless, homeless, hopeless, and number five, you are godless. And I don't care how good you think you are, you are godless. The verse says, without God, godless. There are a lot of good people, moral, ethical people who are going to hell. And they are morally, ethically upstanding people who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Therefore, they are godless. And they're going to split hell wide open. What they need is the one thing that they can get from the cross of Calvary. Look at verse number 16. That he, that is Christ, might reconcile both, that is the Gentile and the Jew, the circumcised and the uncircumcised, the lost and the saved. Christ is in the reconciliation business. Christ will reconcile both all of these people unto God in one body. How does he do it? By the cross. Thus, the crisis of the cross. When you see the cross of Calvary, you have to make a decision. Because in the cross of Calvary, let me tell you, you find a Christ, you find a friend, you find a home, you find a hope, and you find a God that everyone needs. I remember the story told several years ago about a young man whose family lived in New York City. And his mother and father both worked during the day. And one summer day, while out of school, unfamiliar with all of his surroundings, he was out and about playing in the neighborhood. And he got lost. And he got scared. And he got worried. And he rounded a corner and he found a police officer, a New York City police officer, and went up to the police officer, the story says, with tears in his eyes, and admitted that he was lost to the police officer. And the police officer said, well, what's your address? He said, I don't know. He said, well, what's your phone number? And the little boy said, I don't know. He said, well, where do you live? He said, I don't know. And the police officer thought, how am I going to get this child back to his mother? She must be worried sick. And then the little boy remembered. He said, I know that if I look out my window, I can see a church steeple, and on top of it, there's a cross. And the police officer knew exactly where that church was. And the little boy said, are you ready? He said, show me the cross and I'll find my way home. Amen. And let me tell you, there's not a human being on this planet that does not have that same need. Amen. Show them the cross and they won't be Christless and they won't be friendless and they won't be homeless and, 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 and they won't be hopeless and they won't be godless because on that cross, remember verse 16, by the cross, on that cross is their Christ. On that cross is their friend. On that cross is their home. On that cross is their hope. And on that cross is their God. Show me the cross and I'll find my way home. Father, thank you for our time together tonight. Lord, we pray that your blessings will be upon Brother Greg and as he leads this great church. Thank you for their influence, for their willingness, for their faithfulness. And I pray, Lord, that you will use them mightily in Belton, Missouri to show their friends, their family, their co-workers, their classmates the cross. 
the cross upon which Jesus died and reconciles us to God through his shed blood. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.